you talk back to when you were younger and we're kind of somewhat in the same the same age and it's funny when you were my instructor you know i saw you as being like a lot older but in reality you're only eight or nine years older maybe if, if even that so we grew up probably listening to a lot of the same things and you used to be able to tell just by the drum tuning who it was like the west coast cores had that real tight sound bridgman you know it sounded like they needed a drum key you know because that stuff was just so them 15 inch snares and you know real like that east coast sound and uh like phantom had their own distinct sound so it, it's cool but i get 100 percent what you're talking about and you know you're talking about you were growing up you said earlier you're from the pennsylvania area whereabouts are you like from the philadelphia area or like the western side by pittsburgh uh allentown oh really yeah i i grew up um i grew up just south of allentown like uh, a place called center valley lehigh valley in pennsylvania and, uh, you know, I never forget when I saw my first group, you know, on it, I was coming from a drum set lesson at, at believe it or not, at, the, at a place called the drum shop in Allentown, uh, a guy who was, a, a, a you know, a big, huge influence on me was a guy named Paul Miller. He was a drum set player and a jazz vibraphone player and a piano player. And, uh, that my whole upbringing was like that. It was, it was drum set jazz straight ahead. Uh, you know, and so I'm, I'm, I'm leaving a lesson and I walk through the park in Allentown. And this is a day, this was when, you know, you remember Allentown used to have prelims and finals. Yes. On the same day. Yeah. Yeah. So there was groups going from like 8 AM and there were all day, you know, all day and all night, there were groups warm up in the parking lot. And I remember like walking out there and seeing a group playing these like tap drags and stuff and i thought and i was young enough to think man i thought i was the only one that knew how to do this you know and i come walking in and there's like 10 guys doing the same thing uh i'm i'm pretty sure it was the malden diplomats that were playing i i don't know for sure but it, it you know in my mind i think that's that's what it kind of looked like but i remember just being fascinated with the 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 accuracy and the precision and the uniformity and the sound of the drum. I mean, I was stood there for a while and just really checked it out. And I was just like kid in a candy shop walking around, seeing all these things that, you know, honestly, I didn't know that much about. About how uh, old were you during all this? You know, like uh, 15, maybe 16, you know, 14. Okay. Maybe something like that. You know, early enough so that you're just, you know, you just get out of middle school or junior high school. And, and you know, that's when everything starts happening. Um, yeah. And, and it just, I just couldn't, you know, couldn't even think about affording to do it or no, I didn't know anybody that did it. You know what I'm saying? Like I didn't have any, uh, it wasn't until I went to college that I, I got friends, you know, that were doing it and they were all into it. And uh, those were the pretty much the first people that I knew that were full tilt into it. But up to that point, I was, uh, playing, uh, playing clubs and, and drum set like th you know three nights a week four nights a week exclusively just drum set yeah and uh and it was and then um you know i i didn't go to college right away i went i was gigging so i i finished high school i started gigging uh, this is going to sound really weird to a lot of the audience it's um but to be a professional musician or to take music seriously at that time you did not the last thing you would do is to play music in your high school see what i mean so I kind of dropped out of this music program in high school to be a real music, to play with players. I was playing with a bunch of guys that were uh, part of the Philadelphia Jazz Quartet at the time. Uh, and I was, uh, I think when I really started playing with them, I was 16, 17, and 18. And uh, the, the, the reason I got into that was, was my, the guy that I, had, I told you about, Paul Miller, wanted to play vibraphone and he didn't want to play drum set. So he wanted... He needed, he asked me to play drum set for them. He was looking for his replacement. Yeah. yeah. And he wanted to, he wanted, it was like the, it eventually became like the Paul Miller Quartet. And uh, he played vibraphone. There was a, he was 30 at the time. I was 17. Uh, and the bass player was 40. And the piano player was 45 years old. And we were out playing clubs. I mean, we're, seriously, I was in high school. We, I'd be playing in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, getting, like playing until 2 a.m., and then driving 60 miles home and then trying to go to school in the morning. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I just kept that going for, um, for another full year. And eventually, you know, it eventually, 
you know, you're not going to play in bars your whole life. So eventually I went to, uh, study music in school. And, uh, where, where did you, where did you go to college? I went to Indiana, Indiana, Pennsylvania. And that's where, um, you know, that was the best, in my opinion, that was kind of the best percussion program in Pennsylvania at the time, or one of, you know, that I'm sure, uh, you know, barring a conservatory like uh, Curtis or, or something like that. It was, it was um, a state school, but it had a great percussion director, uh, Dr. Gary Olmsted. He was the, the real deal. And he was, you know, a fantastic timpanist, a fa fantastic snare drummer, really all around. Uh, and he designed this program that was really, you know, I, I think back on a lot of the guys that I went to college with, and a lot of them are like really successful. They all went on to really successful gigs and positions. And don't sell yourself short, Paul. I mean, you're like <laughs> really successful yourself. So I'm sure they, they would say the same thing about you. Well, it was just a unique. It was just a, a really unique experience. And we uh, we shared. um at least for part of the time, we shared like a three-story house that was all just percussionists. We lived in like this Victorian house, and it was just like six percussionists living in a house. And uh, we they had a, a situation where the the percussion house or the the rehearsal place that stored a lot of the percussion equipment was kind of the same way. It was like a Victorian house, and everybody who was uh, a percussion major at school got a key, and so you could practice any time of the day or night. And I'm a night owl, big time. You know, I'm. I'm comfortable at like between two and four in the morning and I'm, I'm good. So that was, so you're kind of like a vampire then. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I, it offered the opportunity just to, just to, um, you know, just hours and hours of solitude and practice. And I remember just really that being a big part of my life was, was, uh, I went to college uh, and I, I had come from gigging. And so I knew, you know, I, I knew every real book tune and usually, usually what the typical keys were even. And, and so I went to college and I felt like um, there wasn't really anybody like me in terms of their experience. Uh, everybody else was like from a high school band program and they came in and it was kind of like, I, I just sort of like backed off and I was like, it, I don't, I wasn't sure what was going on. I, I made the, uh, the top jazz band as a freshman. And, um, you know, and then I, I sort of, I sort of questioned it all and dropped out, uh, for a semester and I really tried. Uh, yeah. And what I did was, was, um, I don't know if I'm just sharing too much here, but no, 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 go ahead. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I dropped back and I was thinking, I don't know, you know, about all this, about like, it's, it was so, uh, like high school band related and i just was was way past that i thought uh, in terms of just i was just a i played drum set and i was a jazzer and and then i i took piano lessons in theory and i and i then i just stepped back from being a, uh, a percussion major and then i just studied everything else in other words it was a, as a state school so you had to take general education requirements so i had to take like foreign language and uh, biology and English and you know what I mean it was and so I just completely dove into that world and I spent probably six to eight hours a day in the library just reading and just really uh, trying to figure it out right and then eventually I came full circle and I said you know what I'm a musician that's what I am that's I don't there's nothing I can do you know that's really what makes me happy and and what I'm what I'm kind of um you know, geared towards doing. And so I just accepted full tilt. And so instead of standing on the outside of the circle and, and being critical of the situation, I decided, okay, the only way that's, that it's going to work for me is if I get in the middle of the circle and make change from within. And I, I remember that being an enormous part of my life is that, that moment, that epiphany of, of realizing that if I want the situation to be better, then it's me that's going to make it better. Uh, if something's going to happen, it's going to be me that's going to make it happen. So I remember um, teaming up with a couple of really good friends there and just, you know, we created uh, a sight reading ensemble for to help everyone. And we just would, would just be so active. I'd look for gigs. I remember we played uh, marimba duets at a Shakespeare festival and, and just and just like constantly found things to be active and be a, be a force for good, you know, and just make, make change. And that's where I really... Um, started to write a lot of music 
Um, and then I, um, I learned that I really love teaching. You know, I love the, the interaction of it. And I love it just it's so energizing for me to teach. I, I just, I just really, really enjoy it. And uh, it wasn't until after that, that I discovered that really. And that was having to sort of step back and then dive in fully. And I gave uh, three recitals as an undergraduate, which is a lot. And I, uh, every single year I gave a recital and then played on other people's recital and just tried to be, you know, was constantly aware that at any given moment, some of your biggest heroes are, are doing stuff. You know, they're coming out with records and they're, they're active and they're making all these things happen. And I thought, you know, I was just really conscious of that. And really thinking, I need to, I need to be productive. I need to do things. I need to, I need to have something tangible at the end of a project, or, you know. And I just became obsessed with be, becoming productive and just writing so much music. And, you know, anyway, I can go off for a while. It sounds like you had that, you know, competitive fire within you before even coming to the the, the drum corps marching arts world. Is that safe to yeah. say? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know what uh living down in Texas um it's 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 very evident that co- competition is part of the music scene here in schools. Everything that you do is competitive. There's like solo and ensemble and UIL and and the marching band competitions and everything is relative to a competition and it's you know what it's a huge motivator. It's like, uh, you know, it's like sports. It's, it's fun to compete. And it usually makes people try harder and get more out of it. But it, it's, it still is an art form. You know what I mean? And it's still personal. And it's, it, as long as you don't lose that, and it just becomes all about winning and, and the competition and all, it's eventually, I think it would be, you couldn't help it, but be a little bit destructive, you know? So you go from performing marimba gigs at a Shakespeare festivals to like drum corps how did the transition go to drum corps was it somebody saying hey you should try this out or were you still like watching stuff from afar or or no when i went to school i uh, there was a couple of people that you know was really a unique place and the marching band was really really um it, it just i look back on it as being kind of a perfect place for for anyone that was interested in in taking it further because it was a student run ensemble um you know the the there was one band director um, and and he surrounded himself with undergraduate students mainly and and people that so it was all delegated and it was perfect uh, the way that he figured it out it was really terrific um, and it gave everyone an opportunity to take ownership over it and really just it, in other words you weren't just doing what you were told to do it was up to you and you know, we would have meetings at his house in terms of what we're gonna play you know like programming um, and that was like one of the first times that I felt like, okay, if I thought something was cool, then let's play it. You know what I mean? There was no, there was no like nothing more than that. It was as simple as that. It's just like, if I thought it was cool, then let's play it, you know, or let's, let me, let's talk about it as a group and convince people like we should do this, you know? And uh, all the music was written by students, um, you know, and, and uh, that really is where uh me and several other people really cut our teeth in just writing music and just, you know, the, the whole, the whole deadline of writing music and, and just transcribing and, and, you know. So were there other drum corps people in that ensemble? Is that, was that how, was that what drove you to like go March drum corps? Yeah, it was this really great eclectic mix of different drum corps, you know, uh, several of my really good friends were, were, they marched in the the Bridgman and the Phantom Regiment and the Twenty Seventh Lancers, and some of them marched like in the Crossmen, and you know it was like a, a wide variety of of people. And you know, and I heard a friend of mine play Scottish snare drum, which was kind of the Lancers thing, right? Yeah. And I just was fascinated by. It. I just think it was just sounded cool. I mean, I liked the rhythms and I liked the style of it, and I thought it was really neat. And so. Um, you know, we, we just, we just all became really good friends and say, Hey, you know, you should do this. You know, I remember, I remember, uh, coming to see them on tour in Allentown cause I was home and, uh, you know, and there, and the, it just was the first, you know, first step towards doing it. And then I just sort of dove in and it was honestly, um, that whole nomadic lifestyle was perfect for me. That's kind of what was this, was this like 1984? Yeah. 
because th- they had those those killer lines in in the eighties. And I want to say their eighty four line got like second, but the core got like twelfth, something like that. Yeah. I I did not march in eighty four, but all of the of the friends that I had did. And then, and then I marched in the 85 and 86 and it was, uh, especially 85 was pretty much the same group, uh, really, cl- you know, close to it. There were some new people, but they only took a, a couple of snare drummers, um, that were new. Uh, it was me and another guy who coincidentally lives down in Texas, Drew Lang, who's a freelance percussionist with the Dallas symphony. It's, it's a small world. And so, yeah, we were just, it was all like totally new to me and the whole, you know, there it's a, it's obviously it's a, um, you know, the whole lifestyle is full of tradition and, and, and by rote playing. And, you know, Charlie Poole was the, the guy who was in charge of it. And he was a great mentor, a really terrific um, personality, you know, in terms of just standing up in front of the line, he would, you could tell easily, like when he was standing in front, in front of you, the group would play better, you know, and it was like that cause and effect of having a good teacher um, teach you. And, and then I remember getting his music and it was all, written, you know, most of it was all written on like a legal pad in pencil. And so you got like one copy of the part and then somebody had to learn it. And you sort of like down the line, you just learned the, basically the whole show by rote. Um, and I, th- you know, honestly, I, I think that was ultimately like kind of the best way to do it, to be honest with you. And so every, we would all sit around the core hall and we would get pots and pans out from the, you know, it was like a bingo hall, but at a kitchen. So you had all these pots and pans and you had to sit on a pot and pan to get yourself to the right height. And you had those Gladstone rubber pads, you know, the, the suction cuppy things. And so uh, you just you basically the section leader uh, would play it and then you'd play it. And then, you'd, you know, you honestly, it was like a one on one down the line and play it. And uh, it was just like a level of detail that was fascinating for me i mean we were we were really good too but the you know the one lesson to learn huh, is is drum corps is a group activity as as we can attest to with the vk uh it's it's a group activity you know you can be the greatest individual or the greatest section or you know and and it it matters a little but it doesn't matter a lot because it has to be a group it's a, it's like the best and worst thing about drum corps is it's a group activity and so you kind of move together as a group or you don't. Yes. You're, you're only as strong as like your weakest link. So you got to make sure that the, that weakest link is strong, if that makes any sense. And know. there was a lot of history. I just like, enjoyed the, the, you know, the history behind it and a lot of, uh, you know, it was like an old storied core. Uh, and I, I play, I actually aged out when the core. Um, their last year. Yeah. Yeah. Their last year yeah. in existence. So did, uh, do you still, uh, do you get triggered when you hear Danny Boy at all? Because that was like a core <laughs> song, right? Does it do anything to you? You know, it's been a long time now. Not, how long? I mean, it's been like forty years or you know, something like that. We, we don't need yeah. to go in. We we don't need to go into how long right. it's been. But but uh, it, after a while, it sort of like wanes. It's you know, it's funny because I talk to kids now, and it, there was a time when everybody generally knew a lot of the history in drum corps, like all the students. But now I think it's it's getting. Um, less frequent you know they don't know like who certain people are and i always find that a fascinating part of the the teaching experience in the summer is just telling them all these stories and all of the 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 names and and teaching them who these people were and what they did and how important they were and you know it's and the and the students love it they they just eat it up you know yeah i remember uh about a year or so ago somebody posted in the in the coffee shop uh Facebook page a picture of the 86 uh, snare I and E and it was like this long old list and I'm going down and I see Paul Renwick <laughs> not Renwick <laughs> Renwick it's like it was pretty funny I t- yeah I I I thought that was kind of a fun thing to do and I went in and totally improvised like true story I I went in I kind of had like maybe a lick or two I figured out but it was basically um, wing it and improv because that's kind of what I was used to as a as a drum set player. I was um, improv improvising was a, was everything. It was the biggest part of my, uh, you know, the way I made music was always by rote and always improvising. And it was always like soloing and making up things. And that's why I think the transition to writing music was really easy for me because, because improvising is a, a very small step away from, so, you know, writing music. And I remember just, I, I just went up and, and, um, 
I just made it up. You know, I just, I just on the spot, just in the moment, I just made up a solo. And uh, I, I don't think you're the first one that's ever done that. I, I, in fact, I think a lot of people do that. I didn't realize how the process started because nobody would tell nobody said anything i had no idea how it went so they basically went on stage and they said something and then i just broke into it and playing it was like it was i was really happy with it It was like really playing well and then up comes a guy on stage so it gets me to stop because i didn't start <laughs> <laughs> so i didn't start after like the official timing and all that kind of stuff and so the second take through it was i don't think it was quite as good but it was it was hilarious. Everybody in the whole place, I kind of laughed, and it was really funny. But then uh, I competed. Then I thought, oh, okay. So a lot of uh, everyone who's who's competing like really worked it out. They like wrote their solos out and really figured it out. So that so the very next, like a couple of months later, I competed at PASIC and just got edged out and came in third in the top three. Um, and um, you know, because I just worked it out. You know what I mean? I just sort of, sort of wrote the solo out. So, yeah, that was fun. So we're talking about the, your two seven days and, and Charlie Poole. Have you taken anything from him and incorporated that into to the way you teach? Any lessons that maybe you learned from him or any things that, that you've learned? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think you can't help but experience something like that and – uh, like some of it really seeps in, you know, I remember there, like there was, you could easily say that there were certain things that Charlie valued that I, I, I value too. You know what I mean? Like, like musical expression and dynamic shaping and sort of, um, you know, it, it, just the, the extreme dynamic range and, and just sort of the expressive quality to playing snare drum. I thought it was a huge thing. If you ever listen to Charlie play snare drum, he's, He's fantastic, man. He was like a multiple individual solo winner when he was like a really young kid. So he's got this really natural sound and it's just warm and just sounds so good. And I remember um, I'm that's that's where I, I kind of work the best is when I just see see people that I don't need to take lessons or anything. I just need to see somebody play and I can I can sort of get a lot out of it. So I remember really getting a lot of just watching him play, um, you know, just that the. the the times that he would come up and play. And I remember, I remember really just appreciating like the quality and the, the warmth of the way he played and just the, uh, everything had a, had a direction and a shape to it. And I remember, I remember just thinking, I agreed with that totally as being a musician in, in other areas before I got there, I totally got it. Yeah. There's, there, there's a, definitely a lot to be said about that individual quality of sound, you know, when someone plays, especially when when you hear it and it just sits and it's like man that's that sounds fantastic i there's there's a few people i've heard like that and more than a few there's there's people i hear like that and i, I just i really like good sound quality you know yeah yeah and it was all uh, it was all um you know honestly from a teaching standpoint i think i i just really appreciated uh how he could unify a group you know what i mean how he could bring everyone to the same moment and and get rid of the scatterbrain thinking and everyone be like totally focused. I remember thinking that that was an important lesson to learn in terms of being a teacher. So that's cool. So around that same time that you're finishing with two seven, is that around the same time you finished there at, uh, at, at college in Pennsylvania? With your yeah, I finished like the next year. I think, uh, the, the year after that, I think my very first teaching experience besides playing was I did a camp for the blue coats. Um, and that was when I was, uh, probably the next year, maybe, right? I can't remember if it was 80, 80, 87 or eight. Um, I did not know that. Yeah. But Charlie took over the group. I don't know if many people know that, but he actually took over the percussion program there. I want to say for two years, maybe I could be wrong, but I think it was about two years. So the first year, uh, being in, in going to college near Pittsburgh, it was a relatively short drive. You know, I could just get there. But then I got there and helped out and taught. And then I quickly realized there was way too many instructors. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, it was a, a chaos. You know what I mean? It was like, okay. It's it's fu it's funny to hear somebody from now talk about there being too many instructors in the 80s. Because it was like, not what it is now, but for, that, for you to say there's a lot of instructors, it must have been like a lot, yeah. I know, yeah. I mean, I was used to, like, when I was, uh, uh, you know, teaching at North Texas and when we, we 
took the indoor group, it was pretty much me. I was the only instructor, right? And if, if there were other people, it would be just coming in for a weekend or whatever it was. But, um, and then even in drum corps, it was like you're saying, it was like uh, just maybe three instructors max. And now, now there's like an instructor for your left hand and your right hand. And, you know, <laughs> and then um, I finished college and then moved to uh, Texas. So what what took you down what took you down to Texas? Why why UNT? You know, it was was legendary. It was renowned. It was one of the absolute top um percussion schools in the country if not the world, you know. And it was um being from Pennsylvania, it, it could have been on Mars. It seemed like it was just an exotic foreign distance, you know what I mean? And I was all into playing. I, I got a gig this summer before I moved down there playing drum set. I played um, six shows a day, six days a week playing drum set. And uh, and then I went down to North Texas. It seemed to have it all. Um, you know, I auditioned at at four of four of what I considered the top places and I got into all of them, but I could I couldn't really afford some of the really, really expensive conservatories were just kind of out of reach. And it was, it was nice to, to get a letter from Fred Hinger and get the scholarship for the Manhattan school of music, but there was no way I could afford it. <laughs> it was like a very depressing time to, to play that, that, you know, that well and get a, get a letter from him and get the scholarship. And the scholarship was just like a grain of sand. It was like almost nothing. Now I think, I think colleges and conservatories have figured out how to, how to um, how to support the students with with tuition waivers and things like that. But North Texas had this weird combination of it, it was affordable and it was this uh, this behemoth of a percussion program. It was really large. It had everything. You know, it had had the 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 lab bands and it had the percussion ensembles. Had the steel bands and had the uh, you know the indoor drum line was absolutely at its infancy. And you know what? I just found out. Uh, that I was just at home in that environment, you know? And I still, I say this to this day because obviously teaching at a university for as long as I have, um, not everyone at the university level likes drum corps, right? That's it's just <laughs> basically- it gets, you, get, you get looked down at, yeah, because you It's, a, it's an understatement, yeah. You know? yeah. But I, you know what? I just really, I am comfortable teaching a drum corps. I like the environment. I like the, um, I don't know. I like the rapport with the students. I like the being on the road. I like the sh the constant performances. I like the teaching environment. I think it's just really, I just have a um, an affinity for it. You know, I just have a knack for doing it, and I I just really recognize that. And then the I went to I got a master's degree um, in percussion performance, and I was the principal timpanist for the symphony. Uh, I played played in everything I could, you know, it was the same mindset of, of just doing as much as I could do. Um, and then I, uh, one of the assistantships later was teaching that group, right, which is was kind of in its infancy, it was started bef uh, certainly before I got there, but it was only a couple of years into it. So it was, it was kind of just getting its legs and feeling it out. It was, it was are we uh, talking about we're talking about the drumline? Yeah. And and so I was I went down there and was fortunate enough to um, um, you know to to strike up a great relationship with with Dr. Shitromo, who's the head of the program and he trusted what I did, and then um, you know just sort of was able to once again just just there were no restrictions. In other words, it was like if I thought it was cool to play this, then we would just do it. And I thought that was fantastic. And I was just really thoughtful about the you know, like what it was. And it was, uh, you know, it's funny because now um, there'll be, there'll be comments that somebody will, will kind of hint at the fact that, that, uh, that I don't do the indoor percussion thing, but honestly, I did it at the infancy of pre WGI. As a matter of fact, that was, that was some of the people that had played in North Texas. Um, I remember um, some people who who played in the group that I was teaching be, became really influential people in WGI, and uh, that I think WGI started. Um, I'm I'm gonna guess like ninety two, ninety three. I want to I want to say right around there, and then it really blew up towards the end of the nineties, at least yeah. here on the West Coast, because we we had our own like spring drumline that was pre indoor, 
And then I remember somebody saying, yeah, you know, we're going to go play drums in a gym. I'm like, drums in a gym? Why do you want to do right. that? But, but yeah, and now who would have known that it it's as big as it is now? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so you, you talk so, – you, you, hold on. You talk about WGI real quick. Let's mm-hmm. let's touch on this for a second because you even mentioned it, that people say, you know, you don't do the, the indoor stuff. And, you know, you were talking about you did it back at PASIC in, in the early days before it was WGI. Do you ever get that itch? To, to like try to put together or teach a, or write a WGI show on the, the highest level? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I think that, um, first of all, like, I, I think the basic competition was such a unique, rare thing. I think there's sort of nothing like that. It was, it was pretty much, uh, you know how like WGI has regional events and then eventually everyone competes in sort of a small um, season, more or less, and then they come together at the end at finals. I I thought P- PAS the the competition at PASIC was was unique in the fact that it was a one shot deal. You you know what I mean? You you prepared and prepared, and it was like your first game was the Super Bowl, and I thought that was pretty intense, and it was some of the most memorable experiences and performances that I could. I, I can think about right now. It was off the hook. It was the, the uh, energy and the excitement level was just unparalleled, I think. And that was because there was so much riding on it. And it wasn't, it wasn't like the end of a season. It was like a one shot deal. It was like, it's not concert. like this. It's not like this. You could see the progression through the season to the end. It's boom. There yeah. it is. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Let's see what you got, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, and I just, once again, I, I can't stress enough that I, I was just at home in that environment. I just enjoyed it. I liked the sound of it. I liked the teaching end of it. I, li- I like everything about it. And I thought it was, it was so, so years went by and then some people from WJ wanted us to come and compete at WJ. But, you know, to be honest with you, Rob, the, the reason isn't, it's not some like weird philosophical thing about WJ. It's a practical thing. It's, it's a seasonal thing. Like in Texas, there's a lot of groups in Texas that don't go compete uh, in WJ. And uh, it's, it's really for a practical reason. So if anybody thinks it's because of a, um, like an ethical stand or I don't like it or I, you know, not, it's not true at all. It's, it's the fact that it's in the part of the year that we don't do marching band. We don't do like Texas in Texas, the fall is for the marching end of things. And that's it. And then when the when the fall semester is over, it's concert literature. Yeah. So so you're asking somebody in a band program to forego that or to not do that, and then do do the marching thing all year round, and that would be extremely frowned upon. Like I don't know too many people that would would like that. But you got to break. You got to break. You got to break that mold, Paul. You got to come out there and like write a show. You'd have to do it in a way that was conducive to you know because was when you do that the band directors or who are in charge would think like you're taking away yeah. something from what they're doing already and you know honestly they they kind of have a point a little bit it just takes a lot of time and it's an enormous amount yeah. of time i think i think the one thing I, I mean i have done wj like vanguard i took vanguard to wj twice and we made finals both times uh and i didn't think i just felt like it wasn't uh, you know, like the, the, the situation didn't allow for the time commitment that I had at North Texas. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we could rehearse, uh, we rehearsed, I'm, I'm a big fan of rehearsing for shorter amounts of time more often than one big long, you know, a lot of times WJ groups get together and they block out the entire weekend. Yeah. I'm definitely not that guy. We, 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 when we went to P- PASIC at our, at, you know, at, especially in the two thousands, um, it was, you know, we rehearsed like tw- two nights a week and Sunday, and that was it. Yeah. And so I knew that I was under the gun because I was at a university and people were frowning upon the fact that if you rehearse too much, then that was not a good thing. People are not going to uh, look favorably upon that. So I just became really good at being efficient. Um, prior to that, it was called, it, you know, being so new, it was all like open-ended and things would take forever. And it, you'd rehearse way into the night and... You know, because it just took so long because inexperience, you know, people just didn't know how long it took. And so the more I did it, the better I got at being efficient with time. And, you know, we'd hit it hard about three weeks before PASIC. But before that, it was really methodical and very planned out and it was not rushed 
Um, and I felt like, I felt like, especially in the last several years, it was really kind of where it should be in terms of the amount of time that you spent doing it. I really think the, you know, the musicianship, it seems like in Texas is pretty high, is pretty high. Cause there, it's not just about drumming. It seems like a lot of the students that go through the musical programs are, are just good musicians overall. And we talk about WGI. There are some WGI groups there in Texas. And it's like, if they figured out the show design part that they, they, I mean, they have the hands and, and stuff to compete at that highest level. But it's like, I think that the show design just needs to be a little bit better. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know much. I'm just like, I'm just the average guy that just watches yeah, this stuff. Yeah, I, so. I mean, I get, I mean, everybody, you can, you can, you can be critical of anything when yeah. it comes to, to And I'm stuff, trying not to be, because I'm not critical. I'm trying not to be critical at all. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think an honest criticism is fine. You know, I, I, I don't think that's bad, but I think the percussive art society was uh, an organization founded in music. And then you would simply do it on the move just because that's the way it ended up. Being. Because why not? Yeah. Yeah. WGI is by definition, by nature is a, is a winter guard international visual organization that added live music. You know what I mean? Like winter color guards have pre-recorded music. And so for them to get into the, the area of live musicians playing, um, I think, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe somebody could chime in on whether they think that's 50-50 or it's weighted a different way. But I remember being in, involved in PASIC and it was weighted entirely, you know, like the serious majority was music. And that was, you know, as a musician, that was cool. I like that. I liked it being a lot about the music. Uh, you know, and I think that's what you're kind of saying, right, about the Texas groups. It's like, no, 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 just in general. I mean, yeah, I mean, they they, they play great. Like, one of my favorite shows was one of the groups from Texas last year. And because we talk about clarity of sound and, and stuff, and it was just, I, I really dug what they were doing. But I guess visual-wise, it was just not enough to compete at the, at the high. But, I mean, it is what it is. That's it, And it, once again, it's everyone's take on what they like. You know, I'm I'm no judge. I'm... We did, uh, uh, we did basic, uh, I'm sorry, we did WJ in the, um, you know, honestly, my, it, my mind is, a, it's, it's a, all the years blur together, Rob. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, I want to no, say it was it. like yeah. 2012, 13, 14, somewhere in there. Somewhere we took, in there, yeah. We took Vanguard two times and competed and did really well. But, you know, it was a, it was a pretty struggle. In California, there's a lot of things pulling the students. So it's really, really difficult to get all of the students at the rehearsal at the same time. You know, kids were doing like three groups, you know what I mean? And instructors were all over the place trying to make ends meet. And yeah. I remember that would be one of the big obstacles was the fact that you didn't have a captive audience and a, and a group to really rehearse, uh, you know, and it wasn't until just before WGI that you got everyone there all the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. Before I got sidetracked there, we're talking about, you know, you going to UNT, starting, you know, starting up the drum program, uh, you, you would get some big names in there to, to, to write music and, and help out there. How did that all come to be? I, I know Tom Float was, was there for a while. Well, I, you know, um, it was just, just uh, pie in the sky sort of thing. Like I was, uh, there was, there was a lot of great people teaching there, uh, a lot of great students, a lot of terrific players. And I remember thinking when I started, um, you know, and keep in mind, I'm, I'm like a graduate student, right? And uh, I'm not a faculty member. I was, a, I was a, you know, getting a graduate degree there. And so I thought, you know, this group really has like off the hook talent. And it's really, you know, and I have a lot of ideas. I definitely wrote most of the music and wrote all of the drill and everything like that. But I thought, wouldn't it be great? Like if we want a consultant to come in, we need like the best. You know what I mean? And I remember just the, automatically thinking of two people, and that was um, Tom and Ralph. And I thought, and I didn't, I knew neither one of them. I, I didn't know them at all. And I remember um, just, you know, it's funny. We were talking the other day about this, and I just like flashed back to this whole time. And it was the late 80s, and, I, and there was a show in Dallas. And I, I just, you know, I had done drum corps. I was, I was, you know, fan, and I would just go see the show. And I remember going to the sh to to see the Blue Devils rehearse at a high school, and I just straight up went up to Float and introduced myself. I told him who I was, and I think he kind of didn't believe me at first, but I basically just hi, you know, I'm so and so. I'd I'd like to see if you wanna 
want to maybe come out for a weekend or or do some do some things right and the whole intention was that i would write music with them and i did the same thing with ralph uh, and and i went up to them and i you know i went up to ralph he's sitting on a sidewalk i can still remember that like after the show he had a cast on his arm and i walked up and introduced myself and i you know like i said i don't know if they took me that seriously but i kept following it up and i just kept and and we had become uh really close friends after that and and so uh the idea was that um uh, float would come in for like uh, a long weekend or sometimes a week uh in this in the semester uh maybe a couple of weekends and a week and uh he always stayed at my place uh and we became you know real tight friends for a while and we wrote some things together like i would do, do the um you know, do the transcription or do the, uh, do the layout arrangement. And then he would, we, we would find music. I was, it was always hilarious. I mean, obviously there's a, a, a million stories I could tell you right now about just crazy times. But I remember when I was programming the, the show or the music, I would always, it would always have to go through the filter of float. Couldn't make fun of it. That was, that was the only, that was the only. Dude, that's, that's hard right prayer. there. That's, that's totally hard. Cause like, he can make fun of everything, anything. Right. And I knew that if I came up with something that he couldn't make fun of, at least right away, then I knew I was onto something, you know what I mean? And it was, and you know, he, he was, he was such a kind, uh, smart, um, just, you know, he's just a great person. Right. And he just was really caring and he knew I was young and he sort of like, um, really treated me with respect and and we we became really close friends i mean every time he came to north texas he stayed at my place and yeah and uh and so and ralph was the same way i remember transcribing a, a piece and i wrote the entire front ensemble and then ralph wrote the battery to the to the chart and that was kind of the the main instigator was i would i wanted to write music with both those guys you know what i mean and so then um ralph was was not um he was a little less available, I should say. Like maybe, maybe he would he would come in too. I remember we would rehearse and, and bring Ralph in one time, like during the semester, and Flo would come in one time at first, and then it became a little more. Um, but that was the whole goal: was I wanted to write music with those guys, you know, and then um, and just I don't know, I don't know why it was just this took a took some guts to go up to him and just introduce myself and say hey and and uh, you know. 35 40 years later we're we're still friends or whatever yeah. it was it was uh it was a great time it was about seven years or so that we we uh collaborated 